When I was six weeks old, a baby, tiny me, I never stopped crying. I cried all day. I cried all night. My parents just said I would, I would just scream all the time. They, they kept taking me to the doctor, but doctor after doctor just said, he, he's fine. That's what babies do. Just go home. But six weeks in, I was still crying. And so my mom finally took me to a doctor and they discovered I had a painful hernia and an undescended testicle. It was emergency surgery, um, or at least urgent surgery, and they did it right away while my mom sat kind of crying in the waiting room waiting for me. By the end of it, my six-week-old body was okay, uh, but I had a big, long scar up the side of my stomach and groin, and I lost the testicle, so I only had one ball. Thing is, I grew up in the 80s, so I didn't even know this. Like, I, I mean, there was no... Uh, genitals on He-Man <laughs> or the WWF action figures I had. Cabbage Patch Kids, genital free, right? Barbie, I think, genital free. No genitals on kids. So dolls. And so I was like, Psh, I just thought my one ball was normal. We have one nose. We got one mouth. We got one heart, right? I was like, Psh, one ball makes total sense. Uh, and even when people would say like, ah, I hit him in the balls. I thought that was just like a figure of speech, you know, like, like it squared him or hit him in the breadbasket or I'm so hungry I could eat a horse or like one of those things. But then in ninth grade gym class, my ninth grade gym teacher, Mr. Christopoulos, big burly guy, squat, kind of Greek caveman bodybuilder type guy, he made a wisecrack and it suddenly hit me as the entire room started cracking up that, wait a minute, everyone else has Two. <laughs> what happened to me then was essentially I was filled with a huge and deeply, uh, like a crazy sense of shame. You know, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'll I'll never mate. Like I'm I'm horribly disfigured. Like I might never have kids. Like I was like stressed about this." But over time, over many years, over a bunch of research, over a bunch of therapy, I eventually had discovered the solution to that shame, and it's called telling myself a different story. I'm really excited, proud, and a lot nervous to tell you that that essay that I wrote about that story and the lessons and research that I learned from it and how to tell myself a different story form a chapter inside my brand new book coming out this November 5th, 2019, called You Are Awesome, How to Navigate Change, Wrestle with Failure, and Live an Intentional Life. I am so excited to share this book with you guys. It is my first book since The Happiness Equation in 2016, and it's my first book in this sort of awesome series uh, in over eight years since the book of Holiday Awesome came out in 2011. So, I'm so excited to share this with you. I have not ever had a book coming out while three books has been running. You know, over the two years that we've been having this conversation, I haven't had anything, but this is like special. And so I want to make it special for you because I feel you and I love you and I get your letters and I get your voicemails to 1833 read a lot. So I want to connect with you in a special way. And so just for three books listeners, if you head over to threebooks.co, again, that's a website that's really just for us and just for the show, three B O O K S dot C O, threebooks.co. A page will drop down and give you my beautiful three books listeners more than 50 pages of the book for free. You'll see the cover. You'll see the, you can read the introduction. You can read the table of contents. I've picked out a couple of chapters that are very special, including the one I just mentioned for you to read. And if you're so inclined, you can view all the pre-order bonuses, click to learn more about the book and hopefully check it out if you want to buy one. But that's not the point. The point is I put together this special 50 page package of highlights of the book just for you guys, including two full chapters and the introduction. Head over to threebooks.co to check it out. And now, can we? Grab the tape recorder, hit play and record at the same time. Let's go everybody, let's go, kick it.
who we are is a function of where we are. Who we are is a function of where we are. Do you agree with that? Who you are depends on where you are. You're, you're different people in different places, right? Like uh, I'm a different person with you, my base pen, my, my backpack full of wires, talking to you directly on my podcast, three books, our insane epic 15 year long quest to uncover and discuss the 1000 most formative books in the world. No ads, no promotions, no sponsors, no interruptions, commercial free, ranked in the top 100 on iTunes all throughout the past two weeks. We're doing it guys, we're doing it. But I'm a different person in the conversation with Malcolm Gladwell than I am in my basement. You're different on stage than you are in the boardroom. You're different with your kids than maybe you are with your parents. And that theme is one that we are gonna to get to the bottom of in this conversation. Now, when I say I was nervous to meet Malcolm Gladwell, that's no understatement. I had done over 50 hours of research. I had read his three most formative books, the ones we're gonna talk about. I'd also been listening to his podcast, Revisionist History. I was able to get an early copy of his brand new book called Talking to Strangers, which I highly recommend. It's Vintage Gladwell. And it just came out four days ago, guys. So grab a copy, Talking to Strangers. And I'd been coming up with ideas in the shower and at my bedside table and I couldn't sleep for three nights before. And I was just, and I was well aware of how much the guy costs, you know, like I knew his speaking fee and it's high. It's like, you know, it's in the, it's up in the six figures, right? Like he's worth it. He's a genius, but I was aware of that. And I was so tightly wound. And when I got to his apartment, guess what? I was so tightly wound that I was an hour early. Who shows up an hour early, right? I'm so early. I like planned it out just in case, you know, I come from the airport. I got my rolly suitcase, you know, I got my backpack, everything, but I'm too early to stand there. So I, so I head to a nearby restaurant and grab like a salad, you know, and a club soda, too nervous to even drink. And I come back to the apartment and it's like, I think I'm meeting him at like around four o'clock. If I remember correctly, three o'clock or four o'clock, let's call it four o'clock. And his assistant, Camille, who's lovely and just incredible to work with, she comes, I don't know, like 401, 402, but I was aware that it was like a couple minutes late because I was waiting. And as she walks up, another woman walks up at the same time. And that woman, who I don't know, says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes late. And Camille looks at her and she said, oh, you're both here at the same time. But it's clear the other woman was a bit late. So we all head in the three of us together and we go into the stairs uh, up like 10 steps into the West Village kind of like building, studio, apartment, whatever. And I put my my rolly suitcase at the bottom and I can just hear a voice above me suddenly yell out saying, hey guys, I'm up here. And I'm like, it's the voice of God. <laughs> it's the voice of Malcolm Gladwell yelling down from 50 feet above me. So I'm like, okay, like it's on, you know, like let's go. And so we go up the stairs. There's a poster of Pierre Trudeau former Canadian prime minister, probably the most well-known Canadian prime minister, of course, father to our current prime minister up here, Justin Trudeau. And I say, oh, Pierre Trudeau, cool. And he yells out, my man. Still haven't seen him yet. He's yelling out, my man. I'm like, okay, like we're vibing. Let's, let's keep going with this. Let's go in the flow. So I go upstairs and Camille comes with me. She's like, oh, you know, Malcolm, you know, so-and-so is here. They were, they were late and, you know, but you know, then you have that meeting at 445 and in my head, I'm like 445, uh oh, like, I don't have that much time for this. I didn't know if I had a time limit. So like, I just heard one 445 and he's like, oh, no, 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 what should we do? And, and I just, I, I couldn't resist because I was listening to them. I was like, oh guys, I, I can come back later. <laughs> I'm like, I can just, I can work around me or tell me to wait, whatever, whatever's easier for you. And Malcolm looks me right in the eye. I think it was the first time we'd actually made eye contact then. And he's like. No, you were on time. She can come back. She was late. And I was like, justice is served by Malcolm Gladwell. He gets me a glass of water. We sit down. We're in the room surrounded by books, floor to ceiling, all hard covers on all four walls. So I'm intimidated. I'm intimidated. But at the very end of the podcast, right after we hit stop, you're going you're gonna to hear him say, well, you're not going to hear him say, because it's right after we hit stop. He said to me three words that completely made me feel awesome and relaxed and like I nailed it, even though I was so anxious and nervous throughout the entire interview, which I think you're, you're, you're going to hear. So at the very end of the show, I will, of course, tell you which three words he said, as well as a couple cool little Easter eggs about the experience of hanging out with Malcolm Gladwell. 
And now, enough of me prattling. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us on our epic quest to uncover and discuss the world's 1,000 most formative books, three books at a time. And now let's head down to the West Village to talk and hang out with Malcolm Gladwell. Let's go. Okay, here we go. I just pressed record. Hi, Malcolm. Hi. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, and so we're in the West Village. Yes. Yeah. And that is that neighborhood's known for its trees. I saw beautiful trees. Yeah, quiet it's, it's an old, it's an old, quiet, was, uh, it used to be the kind of literary, uh, you know, where all the writers lived. It is no longer, but. Some of the writers. Some of the writers. Still, yeah. still live yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I really appreciate you coming on three books. You know, I'm, I'm on this 15 year long quest to uncover the 1000 most formative books in the world. I'm trying to do it by interviewing 333 of the world's most interesting people and asking them which three books most shaped their lives. So to kick this off, I thought I'd just kind of give you three quotes you've said about reading and ask you for any reflection or comment that may pop to mind, and then we'll just jump into the three books. Okay. Number one, from the Globe and Mail, you said, books are markers for ideas I'm interested in. That's why it's so important to have physical books. When I see my bookshelf expanding, it gives me the illusion that my brain is expanding too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I like that. The illusion. This is not true though. I mean, we're sitting in a room right now where I see one, two, three, four, five, six level high shelves of books on three, oh, I guess four of the four walls surrounding us. I do feel smarter. Good. That's, that's the intention. <laughs> There's only a fraction of my books, I should say. Oh yeah. How, yeah. What's your, how, how, how do you, uh, most of my books are, uh, I have, a. Uh, a little place up in the country, and most of my books are there. Do you, do you know how many you have? Is it a quantity no, I, thing? No, I, no, no I yeah. It's just some people hear, hear about all these interesting libraries. Um, from The Guardian, you said, rereading is much underrated. There's a book I've read once every five years. I won't say the title now. Um, since I was age 15, I only started to understand it the third time. Yeah. How do you decide what to what to reread? Is it just which whatever well, hits you? Yeah, there's no logic to it. It's just I... My eyes fall on the book, and I think it might be useful to kind of... You judge uh, by the cover. Um, no, I just say <laughs> I remember something about the experience of reading it and want to relive that. Ah, oh, beautiful. Um, mental memories. There we go. And the third one I brought, I pulled out for us from The Atlantic. You said about reading the news specifically, and although I don't know if it applies to other things. My brother says we place too much emphasis on the speed of knowledge acquisition and not the quality of knowledge acquisition. Well, actually, that was a comment he made about reading, that people fetishize how quickly people learn to read. And he says, who cares whether you learn to read at six or eight or ten? Mm -hmm. Everyone learns to I'm read pushing, in the I'm end. pushing my four-year-old right now. I'm like, come on, let's, what's that word? What's that word? I, I, yeah. I shouldn't be doing that. Well, there's no, I mean, uh, there's no advantage to reading, learning to read at four versus six. It's a skill we all master in the end. And... Uh, you don't ask someone um, when you're quizzing them at the age of 25 yeah. about something they've read. Well, well, yeah, but when did you start reading? It's irrelevant, <laughs> right? It's uh, you know. um, Cool. Well, thank you so much for giving three books. I loved, I loved reading these books. And um, I thought we'd jump in with the first one. Maybe it's okay with you if I just give the, the listener like a 30-second overview of the book and then ask you to tell us about your relationship with it before jumping into a couple questions. Okay. The first one's called The Person and the Situation by Lee Ross and Richard Nisbet published by McGraw-Hill in 1991. Um, the cover is a white background, big red text on it, and an 1881 Renoir painting called The Luncheon of the Boating Party, which sure enough, men in sort of like white tank tops and straw hats and women like over grapes and wine having a boating party. File this in Dewey Decimal under 302 for social interaction. Um, both these guys are, are professors of, of humanity, social psychology at University of Michigan and Stanford. The plot really quickly is how does the situation we're in influence the way we behave and think. Ross and Nisbet eloquently argued that the context we find ourselves in substantially affects our behavior. One of social psychology's classic texts is essential reading for anyone with an interest in human behavior. So Malcolm, tell us about your relationship with The Person in the Situation by Ross and Nisbet. Well, it's a book that I read very early on in my uh, career as a writer, and it was crucial in sparking my interest in psychology as a 
subject, but more specifically, um, the point of this book, the larger argument of this book, is that it's a book that is really a kind of argument against the notion of character. Um, the idea that human beings have a kind of fixed um, essence, which is expressed um, invariably in various uh, contexts. And they're arguing actually, no, who we are is a function of where we are. Um, and unless you understand where, you can't understand who. Um, and that we have an illusion that we have this kind of fixed personality. But in fact, we are very much a creature of our environment. And that idea uh, has been at the center of my uh, work ever since. Yeah. I mean, I've returned to it again and again and again and again. Um, because I think it's such an extraordinarily important idea and one so easy to overlook. Yeah. And, and like you, you, so I forgot to mention, you wrote the foreword of the, this book and in the foreword, you said you were at this university campus recently and you were making the argument that you can't rank quarterbacks ever because it's about the system that they're in, the wide receivers are throwing to the fields that they typically play on, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody in the audience, I think you say was buying the argument, but yeah. maybe that's why your work is constantly, I mean, it's always counterintuitive to what people naturally think. We all think it's us, about us. Yeah. No, I think that, I think people do have difficulty with this notion because um, once you kind of start to deny the notion of a, of a strong um, inherent character in human beings, then you, it's, it's a, that's a, that idea is a little challenging. I mean, it kind of, uh, it's upsetting to think of people as being so much a creature of their environments. Yeah, less than we can, that we, less, Control than we think. Malcolm, of the three that you gave me, and, and maybe of all the ones we've had on the podcast so far, this is one of the, this is such a, like a nerdy delight book. I mean, um, obviously it's written by two professors. It's just packed full of studies. Like every paragraph is like a new study. And, and when I write, I'm like, one chapter might be hanging on the thread of one study, but this is like paragraph after paragraph. They even refer to like lay people throughout. And um, I, you can almost hear like little squeals kind of as you're reading this. I hope you take this the right way, but I, I always think of you as one of my kind of like nerdier kind of heroes, you know, up there, like Bill Gates, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Malcolm Gladwell. So, um, and, and sort of to, to, to kind of support this claim, you, you said in Wired Magazine, the geek, another word for nerd, gives up acclaim and prestige and all kinds of social benefits in exchange for doing whatever the geek wants to do, for the freedom to pursue whatever course your imagina imagination takes you on. Also, the Social Science Research Network, S-E-R-N, has your face on the front page saying, this is the best site on the internet. I feel like we live in this culture where the pressure to be popular has never been greater. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to aspiring nerds out there? And, and for me, like I'm a parent, you know, for those that want to raise great nerds, because we do believe it is a pathway to ultimate, larger and richer success, what are the ways to cultivate um, nerds? Well, you know, nerdy in the best sense of that word is about um, uh, having the freedom to pursue, to follow your curiosity mm. um, and not to have your cur curiosity be constrained in any, in any way. And, um, and the principal constraint on curiosity um, is the need for the approval of others, right? Is the pressure that comes from the group that, we, that you're a part of. And so I think the key to producing, to, to raising um, nerds is to give a child uh, a sense of their, um, uh, the ability to be, uh, give, give a child a kind of the freedom to be independent, the notion that it's fine to do something that doesn't have the approval of the group, um, to somehow create a sense of self-assurance that isn't dependent on um, meeting the expectations, the kind of uh, the conservative expectations of those around you. I don't mean that in a, in a no, I, I know. ideological way. No, I totally get what you mean, but how, how do you do that? I mean, um, like, like, you know, you post, uh, the model airplane you're building on Instagram cause everyone's like, you have to be, you know, otherwise you're not on there and you get two likes cause everyone else is, you know, posting selfies. Uh, you know, I mean, like, I just feel like the world is pressuring nerds or aspiring nerds or people that are, are these naturally curious people? We all are into the mean more and more? Is there is there things that you had as, as part of your upbringing or things that you've seen other people kind of grow up with that that sort of have ticked them into this free, freedom to follow the curiosity you described? Well, I mean, you option number one is not to go on Instagram. I mean, mm. no one's forcing you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, I think, you know, the, the truth is that 
um, the 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 nerd is not alone, but the the nerd's allies are not obvious. Ooh. So you have to if you're a nerd, you have to look for your cohort. If you're interested in being popular in high school and you know follow, listening to all of the latest music and wearing all the coolest clothes, it's very easy to find people who um, share those goals and will reward you for pursuing them. If you are someone who is really into something quite obscure and difficult, it's harder to find your peer group. Um, and so I think that's the sort of second part of this is to um, is just the understanding that you're, it's not that you are alone in the world, it's just that you need to hunt for your mm-hmm. co-conspirators in the <laughs> world of nerdiness. And sometimes you can get lucky and find them early. Sometimes you have to look a little harder. The great thing, I mean, I actually think that the internet has had the opposite effect. The internet has made it much easier for the nerd to discover his or her cohort, right? Just a, just a small subreddit out there somewhere where yeah. everyone loves playing the trombone so, or whatever it is, yeah. So I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not entirely sure that the internet is this great kind of, uh, um, uh, has the effect of drowning out disparate voices. I think it actually has the effect of amplifying di- disparate voices. Interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, the book's called The Person and the Situation. So there's so many chapters dedicated to the situation. Um, and they talk a lot about control, what pulls away our attention, what behaviors happen um, in certain situations. The authors even say on page 46, small differences between situations are often associated with large behavioral differences. They talk about an example where 76% of people who agreed to put a small little safety sign on their window next agreed to a big, gigantic, ugly, drive carefully sign on their front lawn. I kind of feel like, and I don't know if you agree with this, that like sort of I feel monetized is the new, like I need a shower. Everyone's going after our mind share, our attention, our brain space. Um, the situation, the person's situation describes this really well. Is there a bit of mental defense you, you suggest or you play or you think about when, you, when it comes to the attention economy? Um, how do we, I'm speaking about myself, you know, kind of coming from me is like, I feel so, I feel like this thing up here, my brain is under siege at all times mm-hmm. by anyone. And it's harder to tell the difference between an advertisement and some super, super targeted content now. What's the best way to retain our independence in this stress, in, in the pressures that we're surrounded by these days? Uh, well, people seem to have forgot that they have a choice in the um, pressures, stimuli, information they're exposed to. You know, I'm always struck by how weird it is that people seem incredibly passive in the face of all these incursions. You don't have to look at your phone every five minutes. You don't have to be on Instagram. You don't have to be on Facebook. You don't have to submit to all of these appeals to your time and attention. You can turn off the television if you wish. You know, you, so it's like, I don't, there's a, there's a strange and to my mind, in, um, uh, entirely baffling um, uh, uh, kind of defeatism May people I, have in the face of this. But you got, if you, if you have an email address, you've got, you know, the, the ads are reading your emails. If you're flying United, the, the first three minutes is a loud blaring ad that you can't turn off or turn the, the volume down. If you drive down the highway, you know, it's, it's billboards after billboards. I, I agree with what you're saying. I'm just saying like, there is just a navigating the world that is just harder to find. They say we have, we, they say we have MDD, you know, as a people, we're suffering from nature deficit disorder. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but I, I hear what you're saying. You're saying, well, Neil, just go offline and shut up about it. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> um, okay, can we move on to your second book then? Yeah. Um, which is The Spy Who Came In From The Cold by John Le Carre. I think I said that properly. Um, and so it was published by Victor Golands and Pan in 1963. John Le Carre is a British author of espionage novels who worked for MI5 and MI6 in the 50s and 60s. The cover of this 50th anniversary edition uh, is a drawing of like a broken bicycle, a man's feet, blood on the concrete. File it under 823.914 English fiction. Quickly, the plot is, in the shadow of the newly erected Berlin Wall, agent Alec Lemus watches as his last agent is shot dead by East German sentries. Then, assuming the guise of an embittered and dissolute ex-agent, Lemus is set up to trap Munt, the deputy director of the East German intelligence unit, with himself as the bait. Setting a standard that has never been surpassed, the spy who came in from the cold is a devastating tale of duplicity 
and revenge. This is the book that you read every five years since you were 15 years old. So tell us about your relationship with the spy who came in from the cold. Well, I, you know, I'm a, I love thrillers, always have. Um, and I read huge numbers of them. And this is probably my favorite. It's the favorite of many people who love thrillers. It's you know, one of the greatest spy novels ever written. Um, and, you know, spy novels are, for those who of us who tell stories for a living, a good thriller is an incredibly instructive hmm. um, because it is, to my mind, it is the kind of, uh, thrillers are primarily about plot. They're overwhelmingly about plot. And the kind of standards of the genre with respect to plot are very high. Um, and so when somebody manages to kind of uh, pull it off successfully, that's something that's intellectually of enormous interest to, to a storyteller. Um, that aside, that's my kind of instrumental reason for liking the book. But uh, the book is also, it's just a, you know, it's an incredibly brilliant novel. I mean, quite apart from it being a spy thriller, um, it is this, uh, it's simultaneously a spy thriller, a kind of critique of post-war England, um, a kind of critique of the, um, of the world of espionage and yeah. the business of espionage and um, an extraordinarily and kind of brilliantly bleak picture of human nature. I mean, it's so many things all in one book. And, and you said you didn't understand it until the third time through. Was there more to get with each? I've only read it once in preparation for this Yeah, I'm, I'm still not convinced I understand it entirely. Uh, it's a hard, I found it a hard novel to follow, really. Personally, I'm a bit Yeah, slow, you need to read it more than once. And I love that fact about it. I think um, I think you should have to read books more than once if they're good. Um, the book shouldn't reveal all, all its secrets to you at first glance. Um, and this because, one has because, so much... Why? Because why shouldn't they reveal? Well, because it's, you know, uh, somebody took however many years to write it. Why are you so... Why are we so arrogant as to believe... We can extract everything from a two-year process that we need to know in a couple of hours. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you should have to, particularly if a book has got many layers, it might take a little while to uncover those layers. Yeah, and you mentioned like bleak. I love that word bleak um, because because a lot of people have called this book dark or, or even morally burnt out. And the New York Times said it has a defeatist attitude. I think you said that word. Times said it's a sad, sympathetic portrait. And in the foreword that John le Carre himself wrote five years ago for the 50th anniversary edition, amazing to write your own foreword for 50 years later, he says, and this, this is a quote I wanted to get your reflection on, Malcolm. He says, today, the same man with better teeth and hair is heard defending the inalienable, inalienable right of closet psychopaths to bear semi-automatic weapons, the use of unmanned drones as a risk-free method of assassinating one's perceived enemies and anybody who has the bad luck to be standing near them. Or that same man talks about how smoking is harmless to the health of the third world or how banks are there to serve the public. Today, it does feel like to me, you can find data to support that we live in the best possible time or the worst possible time. Lakari is coming out on, it's a dark time. Um, what's your reflection on this? Where do you net out on how things are today in the grander scheme of things? Yeah. Well, you know, the novel... One of the innovations of this novel was treating the spy services, the intelligence services of the East and the West, the communist bloc in the West, as being essentially equivalent. Mm. Um, like the same moral standards. Yeah, he, he didn't, that was, previously, these kinds of books had good guys and bad guys. And Lakari's whole point was that there's no distinction between the good guy and the bad guy. That's just a, a little story we tell ourselves. And that was a, in the morally divided time of the Cold War, an incredibly shocking yeah. um, approach. Uh, Thinking today, that we could be as bad as them. Yes. <laughs> today is less shocking. So today we're used to that idea. Um, today it's like our kind of faith in the Western experiment has um, declined to the point where um, we're maybe we're much more willing to be self-critical and to wonder are we actually better than our enemies on some fundamental level? Um, and I kind of think, I don't think that's an entirely unhealthy process, that kind of introspe moral introspection. But I feel like that kind of moral introspection was guided and hastened by books like 
uh, the spy who came in from the cold. I mm -hmm. mean, this book is a crucial part of the kind of unwinding of our of the euphoria over Western democracy. So we have that greater awareness about like, you know, kind of, there's a much more gray and less of right or wrong, less good guys, bad guys. And then how about now? Is it a good, do, do you come out on the side of the, the sort of Stephen Pinker enlightenment now? Like there's never been a better time ever to be alive or the sort of more recent phenomenon, the Mark Manson, you know, um, just coming out with this book, uh, everything is fucked, you know, it's, things look to be really bad. Uh, anxiety's rising, depression's rising, uh, loneliness is rising. Yeah. Um, you know, not to put word in Mark's mouth, but I'm referring to the title. <laughs> what a, what a gap between titles yeah. and such prominent books both out there now. Yeah. Where, where is, where is, well, I mean, I tend to be, I suppose I would be somewhere in the middle. I don't, you know, the, Malcolm, you would be Malcolm in the middle. I would be Malcolm in the middle. I think it's possible that some things are getting better and some things are getting worse. I would say that the nature of the risks, um, I think that ordinary risks are have been reduced dramatically and catastrophic risks have been increased. So Whoa, interesting. Ordinary risks down dramatically and catastrophic ones have gone up. 200 years ago, if you were going to die, you would die of something ordinary. You would die of an infection. You would die of, in childbirth, you would die- The flu. The flu. You would die of hunger, measles, whatever. Today, if you're going to die, you're going to die because- you know, we're all good. <laughs> climate change. Oh, or, I see. Yeah. You know, nuclear. Some bomb goes off, or yeah. some. You know, the sort of the nature of the thing. So, it's Pinker is is the the um, the fallacy of that book is that it really is only talking about um, ordinary risks. He's observing correctly that they have declined, but he's left off part two. Part two is that catastrophic risks have increased. I mean, I literally see the black swan behind you. I, I saw it a few minutes ago on your shelf. Um, the fragility, I don't know if you'd agree with that, has increased even yes, of, of the system. Yeah, I think that's an accurate statement. Um, so this book, uh, you know, everyone in this book's a spy, right? Like they're, they're all private. They're, they're covert. Uh, they take great pains to make sure no one follows them. No one sees them. And the whole time I was reading this book, I was like, oh my gosh, we live in the exact opposite today. You know, forgetting Neil needs to get off social media for a second. Literally, people are thinking, follow me, watch me. We put our faces and our names on everything. Um, uh, I just came out of the book expo, and it's like, the guy who's C-3PO is like a picture of him beside C-3PO. We both have our faces on our podcast logos, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, my, my question here around is about publicity, like being so public. Uh, we live more publicly now than ever before. I know for my wife and I, we're like, oh, no. No children on our social media ever. No mention of their names even ever on my podcast. Uh, you know, if anything, the age kind of comes out here and there. But we just made that choice. That was just the line that we had to draw. We are forced to draw lines these days between public and private. Um, how do you think about that question um, in relation to yourself and also to the generation coming up behind you that's trying to navigate a world that increasingly is public by its start, you know? Yeah. Um, well... I'm not sure I buy that argument. So through most of human history, we lived in small communities where nothing was private about our lives. Right. If you live in a small town, everyone knows your secrets. That was the whole point of small. Why did people go to the city in the 19th and 18th century? Because they relished a little anonymity, right? So if, you, if you're saying that in the modern world, um, it, it's increasingly difficult to, be, to have privacy, we're simply returning in some way to a digital version of a state that we were in through most of human history. Um, that the, the, anonymity, the relative anonymity of the city is being chipped away. I say relative because there's still an awful lot of anonymity in the city. Um, uh, we have a long way to go before we catch up to the lack of privacy that existed in the small town in the mm -hmm. They knew when you were uh, human making history. love. They, you know, they knew everything about your life. Yeah, so I don't... Um, so much, they knew so much about your life that the minute any of your secrets were divulged, you typically had to leave the community. Yeah. Right? And you, they kicked you out when they... So, I mean, I don't... I mean, I... I Not many people a, are getting kicked out of New York. No. There's an, a, there's an ahistorical um, aspect to the way we think about these issues. And the issue is not uh, how much of our own personal information is divulged to others. It's what is done with the information. If the... If I, you know, through 99.9% .9 of humanity, 
if you were gay, you hid that information. Right. Because it had consequences if it came out. Today, that knowledge is pretty much, you know, routinely a matter of public record. But in most cases, in the, this, this culture and others, there are no consequences. Nobody cares anymore, right? Depending so, where you are, I depending guess. Depending where you are. Yeah, but I'm yeah, talking yeah. about this culture. Mm -hmm. Nobody particularly cares. Um, so there's a case where uh, a more public world has not led to a diminution of freedom or some kind of oppression. On the contrary, the fact is now public, but part of the effect of making that fact public was to diminish the kind of social um, uh, sanction mm -hmm. that was associated with, um, with that condition. So it's like, I don't sort of buy the argument that all of this, that this were sort of trending in this one terrible direction. It seems to me much more complex. And then carrying that forward, say you were like pre-tipping point today in this day and age now, uh, and you had to make choices and decisions about how um, public you, you were going to be on your platform. Would you, because uh, I'm asking, I'm asking part, partly selfishly and also I think the generation be below us both really is struggling with this. I hear a lot of questions about this. How do you decide what's on limits and what's off limits? What's on, on is, it, is it just everyone's different or are you, do you think that there is, you mentioned um, sexuality. I told you about my kids. How do we learn how to draw lines? How do we learn how to draw the lines about what we share and what we don't? Yeah. I don't really know. I mean, I sort of, I don't know if there are clear rules. I do. I, I, I sort of think it is up to anyone. Some people are very comfortable sharing, some are not. I think what you, what the world does is it does still provides us a choice in large part, but people often decline to exercise those choices. You know, you don't have to use Gmail if you don't want your yeah. Google to be mining your the words of your emails to sell you ads. I could use USPS. You can use, yeah, you could do it. <laughs> and DuckDuckGo. I mean, there's a ton of things you can do if you want to. When, the, when you check into a hotel and they ask for your oh. email, you don't have to give it to them. Oh, you don't have to write down a real email. I don't give it to them. I say no because I, and they also ask me for my cell phone now. And I say no because I just know it's going to lead to four texts asking how my stay is over yeah. the next 24 hours. So, Are there choices like that you're making? I tend not to give people information when I don't think it's terribly useful, but I'm not hung up about, yeah. Yeah. you know, lots of people email me and I didn't give them my email address. I just delete the email. I mean, it's not that hard. Yeah. Or in my lucky case, reply to it. Thank you very much for, for, for saying yes to the show. Now, I know um, uh, I want to be really careful uh, with your time. So I thought we could transition to your third book now. That's okay. okay. I could yeah. keep drilling into that one, but we'll, we'll move on. And the third and final book you've given us, which I adored and led on, read on one flight, which I never, ever do, is The Blind Side by Michael Lewis, published by Norton & Company in 2006. Michael Lewis, of course, is the American financial journalist and best-selling nonfiction author of 18 books as well as a contributing editor to Vanity Fair since 2009. The cover is a plain black cover with white scribbly writing and a sketch of a, a football play. There's got to be a word for what those are called. Dewey Decimal, you're going to love this one. I don't know if you know it. 796.332. This would be inflated ball games driven by foot. Subcategory American football. Don't know how many other sports there are. The plot. In football as in life, the value we place on people changes with the rules of the games they play. In the blind side, Michael Lewis shows us a largely unanalyzed but inexorable trend in football working its way down from the pros to the high school game, where it collides with the life of a single young man to produce a narrative of great and surprising power. Malcolm, please tell us about your relationship with The Blind Side by Michael Lewis. Well, Michael Lewis is, uh, uh, is one of my, I happen to know him, so he's a, he is A, a friend of mine, but um, he is my one of my kind of role models as a writer. Um, I think he is the best practitioner of nonfiction writing currently working. Wow. Um, he's the, he is the, I have learned more about how to tell a story from him than perhaps anyone else. And to my mind, this is a perfect book. Um, if I was, I cannot imagine this book being any better than it is. And I rarely say, say that about a, a book. I also happen to think that the book is, I told Michael as many times, um, marketed appallingly. It's not a book about football at all. I mean, I don't understand why it is parenthetically about football because it involves a football player and has some digressions about football. But it's uh, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. 
um, the home he the home the main character yeah, goes it's into. A, it's a it's a story about a, a this extraordinary story about a a lost child who is adopted by a, a family not his own mm-hmm. from a one different of Michael Lewis's friends really yeah he one of Michael Lewis's friends shares in the acknowledgments yeah and it's about that the consequences of that act of Christian charity I mean it's an extraordinarily to say that this is about a book about football is to radically understate its moral gravitas. I mean, it's a this is a elemental story about human generosity and charity um, in all of its complexity. And Michael's ability to kind of mine that story and take you inside the minds of everyone involved is, is to my mind, just phenomenal. It's per- you say perfect book, greatest non- nonfiction author working. Um, I think I, I, I heard a quote from you online saying, you look at this book, to know what greatness looks like. Um, For those of us who are in the nonfiction space, as readers, uh, booksellers, book lovers, the the people listening to this show, can you take us into your mind a tiny bit on what what the two or three elements that pop out for you are that make this so special? Or when we are reading or writing our own stories, what should we look for? Or what, did it just just strike you? Or what was it? Because I noticed the structure is so interesting. You know, every chapter is like, goes to a totally different place in character. Till you're like spun around like a top till it closes all off. Yeah. Is it stuff like that? Or I know I don't know how long ago you read yeah, it. Yeah, it's just the complexity. It is what seems like a very simple story that he reveal and he reveals it to be a complicated story, which is um, and you know, that's one of the great gifts of great nonfiction writers is to, you know, there's one one method is to take the complicated story and re- render it simple. But it's far harder, far more rewarding to do the opposite. That you enter into this thinking, you know where it's going, and you know what it's going to how it's going to feel, and it feels very different in the end. Um, and it's the way, as you say, he he takes you inside the minds of, you know, this extraordinary. The first first the the husband and wife who who find Michael Orr, um, each of whom have their own complicated kind of psychological relationship to their act of charity. Um, and then the subject of the charity, Michael Orr, this kid who is plucked from the, you know, the projects of East Memphis yeah. into a- Mother's a crack addict. Mother's a crack addict. Uh, really never attended school in any way at all. Doesn't know how to learn, uh, read or write. Literally just playing basketball in the, in the projects. And is, is, a, is, a, is, is adopted into this- wealthy white family on the other side of town. I mean, and Michael never tries to sentimentalize the story or he doesn't gloss over the difficulties along the way. And the result is even more powerful. You know, you're, when you read a story like that, you're on, a, you're on the lookout for shortcuts or mm-hmm. for um, descent into kind of a maudlin um, sentimentality, as I said. It doesn't come, you know? He does he it remains. There's a sort of rigor. Portrait. Yeah, almost. there's a kind of psychological rigor to this to the story, which makes it all the more powerful in the end. I mean, I find this book devastating. It's so kind of. It's beautiful. Yeah. And beautiful. I mentioned that I only mentioned that thing on a plane because I was flying home from England um, after a wedding, and I opened it, and I, I when I was done, you know, on the pretty slow, like the flame, plane's landing. And I'm like, wow, I, I read the whole thing. The whole pl- flight went by. It's that gripping. You mentioned a lot about kind of Good Samaritan rising up. Uh, you know, there's a quote from this book that says, what I learned playing basketball at Ole Miss was, not, was what not to do, beat up a kid. It's easy to beat up a kid. The hard thing is to build them up. Mm-hmm. I've listened to you a lot before I came here today, and you seem to have a lot of very intriguing and interesting ways of building people up. I, I've heard you in your debate with Adam Grant. You said, well, if I was CEO of a company, I, you'd keep groups to 150 people or less so people enjoy themselves. Um, on work-life balance, you, you tell the famous story about your dad going down to Yale for a potential job, but they were working at nine when he got there, and they were working at five when he left, so, so screw that. You know, and uh, I, you've stated your career goal mm-hmm. online as, as, as to be left alone. <laughs> And try new things. I'll try to do that for you in a few minutes. And on on the Call to Lead podcast just rec- recently, you said you ask all candidates to strip schools off their resumes and not mention them in any interviews with you. So you aren't ever biased by where they attended. This is a thematic question around building talent, mm-hmm. which is through this book and 
you have such beautifully unconventional ideas about it. My background is in building talent at Walmart. I did that for 10 years at the director of leadership. So I'm fascinated in this area. What are some other things we're all missing on building talent? Uh, how do we think about this from a fresh, from a fresh start? Cause yeah. you know, the, the talent hiring world is, it's a, it's an old and quite solid industry. Yeah. The, even the four things I just mentioned from you are all like, those are like brain shattering ideas. Well, yeah. I would just say, you know, the lesson of Ma Michael Orr in this book with blindside has a comment at one point where he says, if everyone from my neighborhood got the chance to play football who could play football, they'd need two NFLs. Wow, yeah. And what he means is that um, there's a lot of talent out there and most of it is never found. It's lost forever, squandered. And that is an incredibly powerful idea because the easiest thing for people who are in the talent development business to think is a talent is scarce. The war for talent. The war for talent. The, and that's what you tell yourself when you end up with people who aren't talented. You say, well, there just aren't a lot of these people. Hard to find good people nowadays. Yeah, hard to find good people. And what this book is, one of the many beautiful things it's about is, it is a refutation of that position. Um, it says, if you can't find good people nowadays, it's because you aren't looking hard enough and you're driving past the boy walking by the side of the road as opposed to stopping and picking him up and taking a chance on him. And that, that's just a lovely, really, really lovely notion. Is that true? I mean, is that true? I mean, uh, I know at Walmart, you know, we, we always hired for attitude and the, and, and people loved, um, working there. I know that they, they get a lot of, uh, bad press, but I, I always found everyone I talked to working in, in, in every store was always like thrilled to be there. The turnover was very low. The people were really enjoyed themselves and we hired for attitude, not, not skill. It wasn't like, have you, have you worked, uh, uh, like a little Zamboni before, <laughs> you know, the one that cleans the floor? No. Mm. But is that true as, as the world gets more complicated and fragmented and, and roles become more specialized and jobs become like invented? You know, there never was a, there never, most of the jobs we have or are going to have didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Can you, is it as simple as getting the guy looking to walk into this high school because of the heat? No, it's a metaphor for your willingness to look in unusual places. Ah, okay. I think I that's you. what what he's saying is that, um, and particularly in light of what you just said, that as the world is changing and getting more complex, you can't look in the normal places anymore for talent, right? You have to be willing to take a chance and to push yourself and to expand the boundaries of what you're looking for. Where do you look? Well, I'm not in the talent. No, I mean, when you, when you, when you have folks that, um, that work with you, do you have... Uh... Like what I'm saying is, um, you know, uh, the, the woman who works with me right now, um, she was a fan of my work and, and, you know, we had some emails and, and kind of we went that route, but I have other people that are in the same business um, as me and they're like, oh, I would never, I would never hire someone that like knew my stuff. Like, you know, I always mm -hmm. tell the story about how my wife, Leslie, when we were dating um, on our first really date with the third person introducing us, the, the woman said, oh, Neil runs like one of the biggest blogs in the country. And, and Leslie's like, what, sorry, what's a blog? And that was very seductive to me. <laughs> um, what am I? I don't know if I have. I mean, the you know, I I, I hire so few people that I, these sort of questions don't really apply. I'm not. I'm not. I can't pretend this is a. You know, I have this podcast company now with my friend, but we have you know ten employees. If you if you have ten employees, the these are not. These questions are not nearly as burning as they are if you're Walmart. Well, or, well, yeah, okay. I, I can make the, you know, because you only have 10, they all got to be awesome, you know? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah we, 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 maybe we've just lucked into it. <laughs> Malcolm, let me finish off this incredible conversation. I so appreciate this with, with five really quick fast money questions. They are super quick. You can do one word or a pass if, if they don't fit with you. Um, Malcolm, how do you organize your books? Uh, I organized them by the period in which I acquired them and by the reason why I acquired them. Whoa. Similar to the, the John Cusack chronological in High Fidelity a little bit. A little bit, yeah. So these <laughs> books here are grouped uh, by project. So I did a project, all the books, some of them are, and some of them are booked, are, are grouped more conventionally, but mostly it's by project. Do I take it from just looking around them that you're a hardcover man? I, 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 I dislike Soft cover, yes. Cause? It just seem, seems impermanent. <laughs> oh, I like that. What is your book lending policy? 
grudging. <laughs> What's your favorite bookstore, living or dead? What's my favorite what? Bookstore, living or dead. Oh. Such a good question. What is my favorite bookstore? Uh, probably, it's a used, probably a used bookstore somewhere, but um, there's so many lovely ones. There's a lovely used bookstore. I don't know why I say this. There's one I love in Pasadena, California, because the population of Pasadena is so weirdly nerdy and odd. You know, it's Caltech. It's a bunch of seminaries. It's... And so what you're seeing are the books of these people. So it's just yeah. the most extraordinary collection of books. This, once again, the situation. Yes. Determining situation. what you see. Uh, do you have a white whale book or a book you've been wanting to read the longest? Oh, I mean, I have hundreds. I don't know if I have There's not one like this one thing since you were 12. You're like, ah, I got to get to that. No, no, no. Okay. Um, uh, do you have a book that you'd like to delete from your brain so that you could read it again for the first time other than the three we talked about? Any first time pop that you just could not replicate now? Probably a thriller. It would be uh, uh, The Red Fox. Mm. Nice. Good good homework for, for me and some listeners. And finally, the very last question of the show. And, and again, to say one more time, thank you, genuinely and sincerely. Do you have a final piece or two of advice for those, like many of the people listening, who aspire to be great or better writers, journalists, podcasters, the worlds that you embody and live in, what are one or two hard-fought pieces of wisdom you'd like to close us off with? Well, just that good writing takes time. And uh, if you're not willing to devote, to give writing the time it takes to germinate, and uh, you you won't succeed. Um, it's, uh, you know, you cannot sit down and expect to come up right away with everything that you need to make something work. Um, so the first task of a writer, I think, is to create enough space mm. in time for good for writing to emerge. Um, that's so that would be my my number one piece of advice. Malcolm Gladwell, thank you so much for coming on Three Bucks. Thank you, Neil. was fun. That was fun. Yes, those were the three words that Malcolm Gladwell said to me right after I hit stop button, hit the stop button on the recorder. And, and he gave me that sort of gigantic sort of Cheshire cat smile that you might know Malcolm Gladwell does. It's like a huge toothy grin. His eyes are like kind of lit up. And it was the first time he'd done that the whole time we were chatting. And he's just like, that was fun. And I loved that. He loved that. And, uh, I knew the time, it was like, you know, 4.46, 4.47, so I knew he had like a minute or two, he's already a minute or two behind his next meeting, so I, I didn't want to uh, say anything, I wanted to just sort of let him go, but he looked at me like stricken, like he'd seen a ghost, like his jaw suddenly dropped and his eyes popped open in a different way, like fearfully, and I was like, what, what's wrong? And he's looking at the floor behind me and he's like, your passport is on the floor. And I look down behind me and it's like, yeah, I mean, I had my passport, my, my wallet, my keys, maybe my hotel key in my pocket. And I didn't want to leave it on the table between us just as a distraction. So I put it on the floor behind me and he's just like, so worried for me. I felt like he was my, my grandmother or my mom. It was so loving. You know, here is a stranger that I'm just starting to talk to. It's the title of his new book, Talking to Strangers. And I'm like, he's, he's caring about me. And then he says, I must go. And he literally leaves. Like he just walked out of the room. I knew he was late for that call. And so I start packing up my wires, you know, zipping up my, my bags and everything. And it strikes me that he's just so trusting of me. You know, he doesn't really know me. We, that was the first time we'd met each other. And um, he's just gone. And it's like up to me to like kind of just get myself out of there. And I thought, well, that's so loving and trusting. Like he was a kind and connected person that I just grew even more fond of by meeting him in person. And I hope some of that energy came out in this great conversation. So three quotes that popped up for me, guys. I love thrillers. I always have. And it, it hit me when he said this because he writes thrillers. I, I never thought of a, a book like Blink or Outliers uh, to be thrillers, but they really are. Every chapter is kind of mysterious and there's like a big reveal and it's always counterintuitive. And, you know, there's all these ahas sort of peppered in. I'm like, oh, 
He writes thrillers. We can call them business books, but they're really thrillers. The next quote that jumped out is, the nerd is not alone, but the nerd's allies are not obvious. I love this one because I think of us that way, like me and you guys, me and Three Books listeners. Like I'm super, super crazy nerdy on the show. We talk about the Dewey Decimal number of the books. We file our books that way, or some of us do. We have a secret analog-only fan club that you can only find out more by calling 1-8-3-READ-A-LOT. We have a phone number. Um, we play calls at the end of every show. Like we're crazy. <laughs> My mom and my sister don't listen to three books because I love them and I talk to them and I, they're just dear members of my life, but they're not crazy nerds. And so Malcolm Gladwell's comments about nerdism kind of really stuck out. And I did call him a nerd hero on the show together with like, you know, Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Gates and nerd heroes. Tim Ferriss is kind of a nerd hero, man. Anyway, I need more uh, nerd heroes in my life. The third quote that jumped out is, you need to let things germinate. The first thing for writers to do is create space. And I love this because it just echoes something I believe so deeply but don't talk about enough. You know, secret number six from my last book, The Happiness Equation, was called Create Space for this exact reason. I talked about, I wrote an article for Harvard Business Review last year called Why You Need an Untouchable Day and How to Get One. It's all about completely sealing yourself off from the world um, with no contact to anybody else at all. And so I'm a big fan of this. When he said ideas need to germinate, I, I, that really jumped out at me. And it also made me feel better about the fact that my new book coming out this fall, uh, You Are Awesome, coming out November 5th, that book um, has been through, I think, seven or eight edits. Like it has completely changed in the editing process. And while I've been frustrated with that over the past few years as I've worked on it, I mean, I wrote this book almost two and a half years ago, but it's two and a half years of deep editing over and over and over again. You know what? Maybe the book was just germinating right? It was given time. It was given breath. And I think it's much stronger as a result. So I love that thought. And I want to say a huge thank you to Malcolm Gladwell for adding three books to our top 1000 countdown, always visible and viewable over at threebooks.co slash the top 1000. He gave us number 894, The Person and the Situation by Lee Ross and Richard Nisbet. He also wrote the foreword for that book, as I mentioned. He gave us number 893, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold by John Le Carre. And Malcolm Gladwell gave us number 892, The Blind Side by Michael Lewis. I forgot to tell you guys, another really nice gesture was he offered to put me in touch with Michael Lewis after the show when I told him how much I loved him. And uh, sadly, Michael Lewis has declined the show. He said, quote, I'm tired of hearing my own voice for the moment. So... <laughs> Michael Lewis, hopefully a future guest when he's not tired of hearing his own voice, but just so kind of Malcolm Gladwell to put us in touch. This concludes the formal part of our conversation today. I am so glad you were here. You were hanging out with me and Malcolm in the West Village. That was really, really, really fun, guys. Thank you for being here, and I'll see you next time. And now, if you made it to this far in the podcast, you're a part of the end of the podcast club. This is the chat part of the show where I talk directly to you, you talk directly to me, and we always start off by going to the phones. Hi, Neil. It's Brianna uh, on Instagram. I'm Brianna Torres, 17. I do lots of bloopers uh, for my cooking show, insert air quotes there, Breeze Bites. But I was listening to chapter 32 with Kat and Nat, and I made it all the way to the end. Woo! End of the podcast club. And I heard the word, and you said lapsed, but it was actually lax. So I Instagram messaged you and told you that. And you told me to leave this voicemail so I can be played on the podcast. So I'm super excited about it. And I'm sorry you messed up, but, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Laxed, lapsed. I mean, they sound almost exactly the same. I'm just a super weird communication geek. So I heard the difference and listened to it like 17 times. So um, just want to let you know that. And again, my name is Bree and love you guys. Bye. Thank you so much to Bree for calling in to report a horribly embarrassing mistake I made back in chapter 32. Now, if you haven't listened to chapter 32 with Kat and Nat, uh, go back and check it out. Here is the little snip that is both their excerpt from the podcast and then me summarizing it really quickly. So it's only like, a, this clip is like 15 seconds total, and then I'll come back. Listen in. And yeah, no. pissed if someone doesn't make their bed. Because I haven't, I, I've laxed on that, but they, um, yeah, no, I'm like, and one I went takes- I your kids' rooms this week, and everybody looked pretty neat. Yes, indeed, it is lapsed. 
lapsed. Kat said, I've lapsed on that and having them make their bed. I was like, lapsed? I was like, lapsed. Yeah, it's me again, back Neil. I know this is a bit meta going back in time with my voice before, but I said I was like lapsed, but really she said I laxed, L-A-X-E-D, like I relaxed. Um, I listened to it 17 times as well as you, Brie, after you reported the error. I'm so embarrassed, but also so eager to correct and fix that stuff. I loved it back in The Simpsons when they reported that, you know, when the character said, yeah, well, the 1195th digit of pi is three. You know, the Simpsons writers actually verified that that was correct before putting it in the show. I love that insane and obsessive level of exactitude and of detail, detail and of fussiness. That's why I liked Gen Egg, for example. So you'll always hear me correct anything. If you know some mistake, please call in and I will correct it in the end of the podcast club. Okay, now we are going to go to the letter of the chapter. This letter of the chapter comes from Bavari, if I'm saying that properly. Hello, Neil. Absolutely brilliant podcast as usual, but this would be by far the bestest. The podcast is very personal to me. I share some of the issues as Jen Egg. Okay, so she's talking about uh, chapter 35 with Jen Egg just two chapters ago. The letter continues. It's amazing to talk with such vulnerability. I was born with cystic hygroma, and so the scars are so visible, and I've never even worn a sleeveless ever. And almost until this birthday, I've never even seen my full self in the mirror. I had written to you almost three years ago about getting inspired for a literacy project from Chennai, India through your work. Now it's funny. I'm in the same city as you in Toronto. Oh, that's cool. And I'm working in literacy here. I hope to speak to you in person during one of your events. Warmly, Bavari. Uh, Beravi. I'm probably saying the name wrong. I'm so sorry, but it's B H A I R A V I. Okay. It's embarrassing when you're Indian and you butcher like a likely Indian name. Do you guys ever have that? Are you Chinese and you can't say Chinese names? Call me up if you relate to this. One eight three three read a lot. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I so appreciate that letter. Jen Egg, of course, talked candidly and openly about growing up with one breast and what that was like. Um, and how that strengthened her and thickened her skin and built her resilience, which is a theme we're going to continue to explore in the show. And it's the subject of my new book, You Are Awesome, How to Navigate Change, Wrestle with Failure, and Live an Intentional Life. The theme I'm exploring, by the way, in the book of awesome was gratitude, and the happiness equation was happiness. And now in You Are Awesome, the theme is resilience, all under this larger umbrella of all the work we're doing together, which is about how to live an intentional life. But where was I? Oh, yes. Gen egg, one breast, vulnerability, and this chapter's letter. As always, if you have written the letter of the chapter for any of our podcast episodes, just drop me a line and ask me which book of mine that you want mailed to you, signed, anywhere in the world, okay? Uh, I always offer that for anyone that has a letter read on the show. So keep sending them in via iTunes review, Stitcher review, uh, emails to us, however you want to submit your comment. We read them from anywhere you post, Okay. Now, it's time for the word of the chapter. And for this chapter's words, let's go back to Mr. Malcolm Gladwell. Look for your cohort, co-conspirators, kind of brilliantly bleak, a historical diminution of freedom. It is parenthetically sentimentalized the story to germinate kind of a maudlin. Was there any doubt? We would give the word cloud treatment to Malcolm Gladwell. Come on, you guys know, or regular Three Books listeners know, that if you go to threebooks.co, check out the FAQ, you will find a list of every single chapter of the show that has featured the word cloud, which means rather than highlight one word from a guest, we highlight a whole bunch because they're just so interestingly articulate. But for this chapter, I picked out the word maudlin, M-A-U-D-L-I-N. Say it for me, dictionary lady. Maudlin. Or sorry, dictionary man, maudlin, M-A-U-D-L-I-N. Did you know this word actually comes from the biblical figure, Mary Magdalene? The definition of the word is self-pityingly or tearfully sentimental, often through drunkenness. Synonyms are things like weepy, overly sentimental, emotional, overly emotional, right? Lacrimose, which I don't even know what that means. I haven't heard that word before, lacrimose. But it comes from Mary Magdalene because um, Mary was the repentant sinner forgiven by Jesus. And in painting, she was often shown weeping as a sign of repentance. So since the meaning is characterized by tearful sentimentality or over-emotional, 
It's been recorded that way since the 1600s. They're referring to how she looks in some of those paintings or some of those depictions. It then changed the word did in the 1700s to mean tipsy or foolish from drink. Okay. Maudlin drunk in the sentimental and tearful stage of intoxication. So while we use maudlin now to refer to things that are, you know, overly sentimental, did you know that for a long time it actually meant you're at the tearful stage of intoxication? How funny is that? Did you know that the tearful stage of intoxication had a word? Yeah, it's maudlin. Uh, I can imagine that you sort of both positively and maybe like derisively. Ah, he's all maudlin tonight, giving everybody hugs. But I think it's beautiful. You know, I think that. Uh, Okay, so that's the word of the chapter today. Thank you to Malcolm Gladwell for so many articulate words. And thank you to Malcolm Gladwell for even doing this, right? This guy does not need to do this. He's covered by the New York Times. He has his own podcast that's way, way, way bigger than this one. He is huge, right? He's gigantic. He does huge book tours with huge stops and like arenas. He didn't have to do three books. There wasn't much in it for him, but he loved books. He jived with the show. I hope he resonated with the fact that we're ad-free, commercial-free, sponsor-free. We're doing something just for the labor of love, and he did it. And I'm so gracious and grateful to him for doing it. Thank you to Malcolm, and thank you to you for listening to Chapter 37 of Three Bucks. Until next time, remember that you are what you eat, and you are what you read. Thanks so much for listening. Keep turning that page.